The Founders Theatre Hamilton, a civic building for civic functions, or a black and white minstrel show and the occasional rock concert. A space in the foyer was set aside for a mural and a national competition was held. Of four finalists, Ralph Hotere's mural was chosen. He touched on something that nobody else had touched in terms of the other sort of entries. And there was a subtlety there that was not apparent in the other one. And the fact that he had a very, very all the entrants had a very, very difficult job in terms of trying to overcome the difficulties of the space in which the mural was to go. It was a pretty big sort of a challenge and it needed something so, such, needed something very, very powerful and very, very strong to, um, I think, carry out the theme of what this founder's theatre thing was built. All the time for the time for ourselves, the blues and the blues, the blues and the blues, will be, will be, uh, slightly wider. And there'll be, there'll be different blues, and there, there won't be just one blues, so, you know, there, there will be some blues coming through. <laughs> Don't get me out of this, you want to get me out of bed early in the morning. Yes, I know. Oh, we'd be very good. Very good. <laughs> well, it was painted, I suppose. Well, that, that'd be a, a reasonably cheap solution, I should, I should mm. imagine. Because we'll have to paint it pretty frequently, that's going to trouble. I don't so know how long these, these paints last. It's though. an incredibly ugly um, uh, floor. He's there. Oh, <laughs> really? When are you going back? In about two weeks. I go over to Diane and I'm in the 30s. It's not. It'll be about right. Ah, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would suggest that you um, get whichever position is most comfortable for you. Uh, may I first of all uh, welcome you to this opening exhibition of the work of Ralph Hattery. If I may begin at the end because it is customary to thank people I hear be connected with this exhibition. But I feel the end really belongs to our guest reader. Uh, the people I'd like to thank, first of all, Ralph Hattery and Hane Tupai uh, for their presence here tonight uh, at this gathering. The opening of this exhibition of Ralph Hattery is the most significant one. It allows us to review and enjoy the work of one of our major New Zealand artists. It brings to Hamilton the work of a painter who is responsible for an important commission in this city. Ralph Hotere was born at Mitimiti on the rural west coast in the far north of New Zealand. He has painted in London, Rome and the south of France. He now lives in the southern New Zealand city of Dunedin. Poetry is a quiet, unassuming uh, person uh, whose work has been very much influenced by the American painter Ed Reinhardt. And I think it's quite interesting that in one of his uh, catalogues uh, he quotes uh, Ed Reinhardt uh, with the words, The ugliest spectacle is that of an artist selling himself. Art as a commodity is an ugly idea. Art as an entertainment is an ugly activity. Painting as a profession of pleasing and selling is an ugly business. He produces the paintings, we take them over. Um, he, in a sense, doesn't dictate what we do with them. He, he sends us an exhibition, to, tells us to price them, put them on the wall, produce a catalogue, um, that's that. From that point of view, it's very simple. And personally, he also has a very sort of easy-going approach to his things. He's not sort of precious about them in a way. That's right. Um, often paint is a very difficult raw material to work with. And um, 
I think Ralph is uh, simply not in this category. Twenty-seven quarter-inch tempered hardboard panels, each one numbered and cut to size, then sanded, undercoated, overcoated. I think one of the important keys to the enjoyment and understanding of the work of Ralph Hertry is what we could term this element of music. Music is part of the man, and one would say that he creates a kind of visual music. There was almost a sound of black. Sometimes a word echoes and vibrates like a note. Colour on a black surface starts to sing like a melodic line. Of all our New Zealand painters, Ralph Hotry is the closest to music. Abstract painting and music, I know some critics don't think much of this parallel, but I think it's still got a few points to, um, to commend it and to make it worthwhile um, trying to think around it. For example, I remember I first had this painting to live with for a while. Um, meditating on it and imagining a string quartet. I don't know why I chose a string quartet, but I did. I had two violins, which were the lines running up the centre, and I imagined a viola doing something silly in the corner, and um, perhaps a cello doing something like this. Goodness knows why. About two weeks later, I heard a quartet playing Bartok, and there was one moment when I'm to my rather prejudiced mind, they were playing this painting. Anyway, perhaps that's not a particularly serious approach, but it helps the painting make sense for me. Winter Landscape Sangro River is one of a group of paintings Ralph did in Italy, France and England in the early 60s. This one he did in London in 63. They were all inspired by a visit he paid to a war cemetery on the Italian Adriatic coast where his brother is buried. And, um, I suppose one of the things which strikes us first, that it may have struck him first, is the numbers which we see in the paintings, which are the ages of the men buried in the cemetery. This is something which impressed Ralph very much, and which appears in, I think, all of the paintings of this series. That's one point. Another point is the uh, geometric shapes which he's got there in the painting. Perhaps, once again, it takes a bit imagining to see this vertical cross, and perhaps that ties up with the idea of a symmetry again. But you've also got a very pronounced diagonal cross, a St. Andrew's cross, I suppose, running across the painting. That's, if you like, a beginning for some of the geometric forms, which we're going to be able to see in later paintings, which Ralph has done in the last 10 years. And a third point that I find interesting about the Sangro paintings is the rather impetuous way in which he's put on his paint. And there's much more emotion, I think, in something like that. It's much more expressionistic than in some of the other paintings, such as this Port Chalmers painting, which he did in the middle of 1972. Now, the very cool, controlled handling of paint there on the canvas, the very precise geometric forms, the two squares, and then, once again, all of a sudden, we find another diagonal cross, another St. Andrew's cross. But the Port Jamas paintings were all that he did last year, and I'd like to contrast these two, the Tafiti drawing, painting on paper, which he did, I think, within a month of having done the Port Jamas painting. Now, once again, we're away from the cool, very controlled manner of this painting, We've gone back to the expressionistic, rather impetuous, emotional handling of paint in the Sangro painting. And that ties in with the contents of, this, of the Tafiti series too, because he is dealing in fact with the Maori Wars in the 19th century, with a proverb or a saying by Tafiti and its translation in English. It seems to me that Ralph has worked in one particular direction, refining geometric forms as far as they can go, ending up with the Port Chalmers paintings, and then reverting to 
paintings, a series of paintings which have political and social comment as he was doing about 10 years earlier. The paintings sort of burst out of, you know, quite often very deeply held political and social convictions, but they're not they're not political messages when they come out the other end of the process, you know. They're just, they're just object. This thing is a response to a play by Warren Dibble, which is, I suppose, an anti-war play. And how with this rage is from one of Shakespeare's sonnets, how with this rage shall beauty hold a plea whose action is no stronger than a flower. And in a sense, all these sort of very strident, messed up, screwed up lines in the middle represent the rage, uh, I guess, and, and the painting just, just contains it and reharmonizes it within that circle. I don't think Ralph's trying to illustrate it again. He's just trying to reproduce the mood in the, in, in the thing. I, I don't think he's after sort of simple one-to-one one -one meanings in what he does. So, in fact, this, this cover he did for Landfall 100, what it is literally is just the old title page of Landfall. Or the, or the reverse title page, which he's which painted over and simply written Landfall 100 several times in a straight row and then blacked out the edges. So that's what it is literally. In a sense, you can't say that the meaning of the, the cover as a work of art is any more than that. I think the uh, thing that uh, Ralph Hoetri, uh is working about can be more summed up if we compare the hard edge uh, type of painting, which is very clearly seen in a work like, like this, when you compare it with the softer, more vigorous painterly work, as you get in, say, the more expressionistic uh, painting by uh, someone like uh, Rudolf Gopers. I think here, what is very important is not only these hard edges, uh, but also the, the minimal amount of uh, subject matter that uh, Ralph Hoetri puts into his work. Uh, subject matter as being the actual shape, uh, the texture and the colour. And I think it's very significant to note that uh, in a work like this, far more blue is actually written on the painting and, and its, its title as well. And I think this emphasises the uh, the actual uh, blueness uh, that he's try trying to uh, convey here. And th this is what makes works like this very difficult to uh, uh, come to terms uh, for the average person, that uh, uh, one tends to look and say, what does it represent? In actual fact, what it represents is, is this blue, these two colours of blue on the, uh, this white surface. And this is, this is the sum total of the work. Melody, 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 melody. It's impossible for him to do anything in, in bad taste because in a way he doesn't do enough, ever. Uh, but it's really more than that. It's even the worst of his paintings, it seems to me, are there as very clearly defined objects, and they sort of don't spill out over the place, nastily leaving trails of mess everywhere. He's done some very bad ones. I've got one at work, one of the Melody series, and lots of different colours. He starts off way down the bottom of the colour range and ends up with a yellow, and it's messily done. There are bits of paint sticking out into the black. But even then, it's... Uh, it manages to hold itself together and, and not ever become ridiculous. The middle one's the best, I think, because it's most r mostly Ralph. More of Ralph than any of the others. It sits on the wall, getting more and more like Ralph the more you look at it. Technically, I suppose it's better too, but I don't know too much about that. The other two, though, are just as good in a way. This Pax one is almost impossible to see in most lights. It's a very frustrating painting. You've got to come right up to it. And then when you get right up near the background, it looks a bit like a tamarillo. It's black and red coming through it. But it's still a bad painting. You can't really see it ever unless you creep right up to it. But I think the main thing about 
them being tasteful as they're all very self-contained and they sit there something like sculptures, I think. This is an important opening, for it brings together two of our major talents, Ralph Hattery and Honey Tupari. It is really no accident that the two are here together tonight, for there has been a long period of association between them. Each has contributed to the art of the other. Ralph Hattery has illustrated Honey Tupari's poems. He has used them in his paintings. And Honey has considered the work of Hattery in at least one of his poems. Honey Tufari is one of our finest poem, poets. His poetry is honest and direct. His is a voice which is accessible to all <coughs> New Zealanders. He speaks to, he speaks for, every man. I'd seen a few of his exhibitions at Barry Letts, and honestly I couldn't come to grips with them, and uh, it wasn't until I was in uh, Dunedin that uh, something uh, sort of filtered through, I think. And then I wrote the, uh, a poem, uh, you know, uh, just uh, kind of my own feelings about his, his work. And this is it. Um, he, uh, behind me, there's uh, a fair couple of uh, paintings. One I'd uh, actually uh, bludged off him, but the other one he gave, uh, the one on the Sangro uh, uh, series uh, he gave me to look after. But the other one that he uh, painted in London uh, um, and uh, had heard about my, work, my first book, uh, which, uh, which uh, was entitled uh, No Ordinary Son, and he'd, uh, he'd got that, uh, um, he had a look at the poem of that same title of, uh, in the book. And uh, that's, that sort of sprang out from that, from that poem. And I get this dreadful sort of uh, pall thing hanging from the top, you know, and, uh, and then you get that egg sort of thing, you know, to me, and then you get the kind of uh, H, you know, suggesting this, this terrible uh, horror bomb, you know, and, uh, and I talk about a tree symbolizing, uh, you know, symbolic of uh, life and how it's, uh, it could be cut down, but uh, however, that's, that's pretty good, I think. I think that, that gets at the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it's his own way of protesting. And he's just, you know, put uh, no ordinary sun across it. I think that's that's all right. I don't know about tacking on bits of wood here and there and sort of different colouring it differently, you know. But I think if you stand back on that, it's better under artificial light. Um, at night time, it's good. It's okay. I, uh, you know, I I haven't tired of looking at it. <coughs> the Sangro River one, of course, that puzzled me. The numbers. 21, 22, 23, 24. I thought, what goes on here, you know? I like the centerpiece for this. It's, you know, it's two, two sort of uh, levels, but slanted, you know. But that uh, makes me sort of look at it and explode other imaginative uh, sort of things in my mind. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, this is the, uh, the poem entitled Hotere. And, uh, you know, one of the things about him, he, he never talks about his paintings, Ralph. He, uh, you know, he prefers uh, to sort of know people through ordinary uh, kind of activities, like uh, uh, having a pot of beer, uh, you know, uh, uh, eating. And he's a good cook. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's got a peculiar way of ma uh, doing these muscles, too. He, he puts garlic and wine. And he doesn't even shell them, you know, he sort of uh, gets a scrubbing brush and he scrubs them clean. He puts them into this uh, real big, he's got a big container thing, uh, bowl. But anyway, you know, he, he you know, puts all the muscles already scrubbed, you know, and he chucks his wine in and he throws the garlic in, you know. Uh, and I say, oh, gosh, you know, why don't you shell them, you know? And he says, oh, that, that's all right, honey, you know. 
And then things come out rather shriveled up, you know, and they're sort of leathery. And I think to myself, oh, you know, I'd rather eat them raw. But then he said, no, you don't, it's not that, it's a soup you taste. Long, you know, he goes, cook. So this is how the French do it, and this is how I like them done, you know, it's a, a soup. It's beautiful. So I have a go at that, you know, and sort of munch away at the old uh, thing, at the, uh, at the flesh thing, which is all, as I say, sort of leathery. I prefer my, uh, my muscles, uh, uh, just, just uh, oh, a bit of water poured over them, you know, uh, hot water, and, uh, and really, uh, really uh, raw, you know. Hey, Mr. several friends and one of them suggested Ralph and so Ralph came in a year ago and since then he's been with us on an average of about a day and a half a week purely doing form design. This of course was very suitable for Ralph's work because he was a very precise sort of workman and uh, has helped us immeasurably. As you can see we benefit by it too, we've got his paintings on the walls. Some paintings particularly say his melody, melodies for repetition, screen work. Well, of course this ties in with the sort of work we're doing on the equipment. Repetition, high quality, each one like the last. Without it um, being a pure stereotype copy. It's an interesting thing to see Ralph starting to use some of our equipment to produce certain parts of his work. Uh, he's recently done a couple of exhibitions using what he calls Xerox collages. Xerography is a comparatively new industry. It's one of the fastest growing and quite frankly we find each day something else the, the process and the equipment can be used for. I don't know of anywhere else where an artist is using it. In fact, based on a cover of Time magazine, the one which specifically mentions Nixon and the Watergate. And he's shaped and distorted these to make perhaps more meaningful images out of the raw material of time, if you can read it that way. But um, he sort of makes one or two sort of wry comments about them. Um, he suggests that they might make some impact if they're all pinned to a wall or glued or something like that, and very close together, rather like an Andy Warhol. Print. Or, you, or they could be displayed the odd one or two, or give them away to your right-wing mates, or even fill the odd bogs around Victoria Street West. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, sell them very, very cheaply. Um, he also says perhaps that the next Democratic Convention might like to have them for their campaign. <laughs> he takes something from his experience, or something close to his heart, and uh, creates his, if you like, fairly international images from, from the world, images that have universal meaning from these uh, regional things. Shortly after we opened, we were in correspondence with him. He stated he was coming back, would like to have an exhibition, and it just all happened that way. He sort of made his adieus, sort of packed his paintings, um, turning down a one-man show in London at the same time, arrived back here and created his paintings. We had a look. Um, he disappeared up north for about three weeks to sort of, as he put it, to sort of go away, sort of spend a long time on a long, white, barren beach. And then the exhibition was on. And that was where it all started. sort of, you know, cooings of delight from critics and public alike, there's not any real response. This has always been the case with his work. 
he's, um, he's been very difficult to sell. The type of work is uh, not generally acceptable in this country. One exhibition which did produce, I think, a fairly substantial response was the Melody series. One word implies another, so that the meaning of the painting is, is, is all the permutations of, of the word and all the visual permutations of it, and not simply uh, malady or melody or my lady. So the booklet, in a sense, happened before, but also came after the paintings, and the way it ended up was simply as an extended visual pun, so that it began with melody and visually explored some of the possibilities of that on the page, and Ralph did some watercolours to match. I suppose he liked the sound of the word. It's, 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 it's got nice black sounds in it, melody. And that got played around with a bit until you were running the, the two words alongside each other. Like that. There, that's Ralph's drawing again. There. But the way it ended up was to end up with my lady, which in fact, in the first two words are simply implications of. In, in the paintings themselves, you've got like that thing. You, you don't necessarily have all the permutations of the word in, in, in a single painting of Ralph's, but in a sense all the permutations are implied, so that here you've only got malady and malady, but my lady is, is, is a sort of necessary factor there which you, you have to take for granted. So that uh, in a way you need to see the whole series too. Or each, each painting in the series implies all the others, I think. The paintings are, are very peaceful kinds of things. Um, again, they're like rough in that kind of way. It's just this nice vibration coming out of them. And they're not saying very much to you, but they're, they're soaking up a lot. Today is Founders Day, and that is a day which in Hamilton we do well occasionally to remember. It is a day on which we recognize that the city we live in was built as a result of the labors, the trials and tribulations of older people, many of whom are present here today. I'll leave comment upon the uh, 
the work in question to Mr. Malcolm? May I say a few, a few brief words about the Arts Council and its function. This function is, I believe, to act as a focus for excellence, the maintenance of standards and the encouragement of gifted people in all fields of the arts. This vital function is not divisive, not subject to dichotomies or heterogeneous judgments, but will remain, I hope, the responsibility of one body representative of the very best of our national strengths in the arts. Earlier I referred to the Renaissance of New Zealand art, and this includes the realization of our New Zealand art heritage, could I say our twin Maori European heritage. Our artists have a rich heritage to call on. Mr. Ralph Hotere has done so. We are all in his debt, and I again pay a great tribute to him and to the city. And ladies and gentlemen, it gives me very much pleasure in for formally declaring this mural open for public view. <laughs> When you offer only three vertical lines precisely drawn and set into a dark pool of lacquer, it is a visual kind of starvation. And even though my eyeballs roll up and over to peer inside myself, when I reach the beginning of your eternity, I say instead, hell, let's have another feed of muscles, man. Like I have to think about it. When you stack horizontal lines into vertical columns which appear to advance, recede, shimmer and wave like exploding packs of cards, I merely grunt and say, well, if it's not a famine, it's a feast. I have to roll another smoke, man. But when you score a superb orange circle on a purple thought base, I shake my head and say, hell, what is this thing called? Aloha. Like I'm you good man, I'm eclipsed. but basic statement that is reduced of all European or sophisticated expression without being crude or raw. They're an elegant statement of basic essentials. 